Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to the fourth Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. Uh, my name is MK Jesse. I'm from the University of Colorado, and I am going to have the honor of serving as the moderator for this session. Uh, just a reminder to log into your poll everywhere. Um, we'll have several poll questions throughout the talk. So it is my honor and pleasure to inter introduce to your speaker uh, for this webinar, Dr. Corey Ho. Dr. Ho is the fellowship director at the University of Colorado, one of our assistant professors. Um, he also serves as the director of spine and musculoskeletal intervention at the University of Colorado. Uh, he has helped to pioneer advanced MSK and spine procedures at the University of Colorado, including kyphoplasty, spine ablation, um, soft tissue tumor ablation. He serves as a PI in clinical trials on novel kyphoplasty techniques. He's part of an institutional database for cryoablation and desmoid tumors, has published numerous articles and has um, numerous speaking um, arrangements all over the nation on this topic. So we are truly extremely lucky to have him join us and to educate us in this fascinating world. Um, please, um, as a reminder, uh, if and when you do have questions for us, we strongly encourage that. Just jot them in the Q&A and we'll be going through those periodically uh, throughout the session. So with that, um, Dr. Ho, I will pass it over to you and um, see you in a few. Well, thank you, Dr. Jesse, for that wonderful introduction. So this is my talk, Exploring the World of Advanced Image-Guided Spine Interventions, and I'm really thrilled to be part of the Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club to try and reach the residents and, and give them really good information. So we will be using some Poll Everywhere questions here. The link here we've given you before, but I'm going to give it to you again, pollev.com slash skeletal radiology 217. Uh, these are our disclosures. So first I want to highlight the great colleagues I have at the University of Colorado Institute's Medical Campus that really allow us to take care of our patients and to do all the interventions and to read our diagnostic imaging. The other thing I wanted to talk about too is that MSK intervention is a growing field. It encompasses the term interventional oncology as well. And the important thing here as a side of skeletal radiology is that while not everyone will do these in their fellowships, I do believe that knowing the procedure and how it's done and what can happen really helps read the imaging and read the follow-ups. And also, for those of you out there that don't necessarily get the experience here, remember that the access for these procedures is really not that different than some of the simple or even difficult biopsies that we're asked to perform. It's just knowing the technology and, and the diagnoses. So for this talk, we're gonna go through a, a few patient cases. We're gonna go through a short presentation, go over some imaging, and we'll talk about some treatment, because obviously it's a intervention lecture. We'll talk a little bit about the technology, the mechanism of action, the clinical applications, and some of the pearls that Dr. Jesse has taught me and how we've learned over, over the time, from my time here. So remember that this serves truly as an introduction because all these topics and technologies could be an entire chapter or lecture on, on their own. So for you foodies out there like me, this is more of an amuse-bouche. All right, this is served as our home map for our talk today. Some of you will realize what this is, some of you won't, but you'll, I'll explain to you later. So we'll go ahead and populate our cases. So these are really pretty cool cases that we did here at the university. And I'm really excited to share these cases with you. So as we go through these cases, try and make the diagnosis yourself. I'm not gonna give you the diagnosis immediately and, or the findings immediately. So kind of try and do it yourself. And remember, this is not a true resident sweat session. So just formulate the plan and just be relaxed and try and get something out of this, okay? And away we go. All right, patient number one is a 65-year-old man that was evaluated in the emergency department presenting with 10 out of 10 back pain. The patient did not have any neurologic compromise and the additional pertinent history is withheld because we have to have some fun here. So this is our presenting imaging. And now you notice that the patient history of the patient with 10 out of 10 pain. This is not quite a motion gram, but it's not the greatest imaging, but this is the real imaging that came through because the patient was in significant pain and had to get this MRI. So I'm gonna highlight the findings here. So you're gonna have to trust me here. It's the T1 vertebral body that I'm highlighting here. It, on the left image on the T1 sagittal image, we show 
Hypo intense signal throughout that T1 vertebral body. And the post contrast fat saturated sagittal image on the right, this shows diffuse enhancement. Now, you also know that the shape of the vertebral body is abnormal. It's a little bit squashed as compared to what you're normally expecting. And then we are going into our first question. And this is what is the most likely cause of the fracture? Now, Dr. Jesse is quiet over there, but she did promise to sing to us during this 15 seconds that I give you. So I'm expecting her to be singing. Nobody would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're, time's almost up here. All right, so 100% of you chose, well, nearly 100% of you chose pathologic fracture. And in fact, that is the true correct answer. Theoretically, trauma is correct because obviously the patient did have some trauma probably to, to cause that. And the reason why we're calling it a pathologic fracture because there's abnormal signal within the bone of that, cervical, or that, of that vertebral body, meaning that there's abnormal bone in there. So it's pathologic and it's also fractured. So it's a pathologic fracture of the abnormal bone. All right, so the additional history that I withheld from you all was that the patient had a recent PET CT. They were transferred from an outside facility and they're on systemic therapy for a multiple myeloma. So on this uh, fused PET CT images, you see hypermetabolic uptake uh, corresponding to the MRI findings. Now I skipped the layup line for this conference and we started with a pretty challenging case. Now, there's a lot of patient and operator issues going on with this case. So the patient has systemic disease, the multiple myeloma. The patient has a severe pain. The patient has stability problems as shown by the, the, by the vertebral body collapse. Now, the problems I have with the case are the patient has systemic disease and that T1 location is, is a kind of a sweat inducer for a case like this. So the reason why is that the, the access that we usually use to go into the pedicles usually in the lumbar spine are, is the, well, the axis is the pedicles. So as you go up higher in the spine, all the way up to the, to the thoracic and even the cervical spine, the anatomy changes such that the pedicles rise up and the pedicles shrink. So your leeway significantly decreases. So the other problem with this case, luckily I have a nice, nice scanner for me to do this procedure in, is the angle. So you can see, you can only manipulate the patient so much and most CT scanners, even if they do have gantry tilt, only go about 10 to 15 degrees anyway. And you can see here by our mapping, this one's about 45 degrees-ish. So the nice thing about the software on our scanner is that I'm able to place a, a target area of where I want the needle to be eventually. And then I can place a skin target here. And you can manipulate these in the two planes to make it such that I'm not gonna go through the pedicle and the axial, or not gonna go past medial wall of the pedicle on the axial image. And I'm going through the pedicle and not through anything else on the sagittal image. And the other challenge behind this is the actual procedure. When you're going at such a hard angle, when you're doing CT fluoroscopy, you're only getting you know, a couple millimeters of, of imaging or a, a centimeter at most of, the, of your needle. So most of these access needles are about 10 to 12 centimeters. And as you're going at such a harsh angle, you're gonna have to really have a really good grasp and spatial understanding of where that needle is because you're only gonna be seeing a little bit here. You can see here, this is, I've already reached my target and the needle's in the vertebral body. So here are the images of the case before. And here are the images after we were able to put some cement in. And the trick here, obviously we know that it's multiple myeloma, is that augmentation works very well for, for patients like this. And ablation can also work too. But, you, but they both can be effective. So you don't have to ablate is basically the point. So myeloma is a hematologic malignancy of plasma cells, 60% involvement of the vertebral bodies. These present as osteolytic lesions as in, our, in our bone surveys, and they can often, often cause vertebral fractures. This results in morbidity and mortality, and they can cause spinal cord compression and nerve root compression. So the technology here is augmentation. So augmentation encompasses terms like sacroplasty, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty. And the main, the main thing that we use here is polymethylmethacrylate cement. This hardens within eight to 18 minutes, depending on your room temperature and your manufacturer. This substance is extremely stable and highly resistant to compression, compression forces, but it's not really good to shear forces. The reason, uh, the challenge between, of 
administering cement is cavity creation and directing the cement. So there are devices, you know, such as, you know, spiral devices, stents, implants to kind of help you create a cavity or to direct your cement better. So the complications of using cement are leakage, mainly in the pulmonary vasculature. It can be taken up, especially if you're doing a thoracic area, and that can be taken up straight into the, into the, into the pulmonary vasculature and cause pulmonary emboli. The other place you can go is soft tissue, because this is an exothermic reaction when the cement hardens, it can cause thermal injury. The other place that it can go to is a disc, which can, adjacent, can cause theoretical risk of adjacent level fracture. Now, we all read a lot of plain films here. You can see this, this surgeon got a little exuberant with the cement. And if you look hard enough, you're going to find that a lot of, your, a lot of these post-spine surgery patients do have cement emboli embedded in their lung. So we'll take questions for this first case. All right, so after each case, we're going to be going through some questions. So if anything comes up, um, definitely as a reminder, jot it in that Q&A. Um, I did have um, a couple of points um, of discussion on this case. And as, um, as Dr. Ho, you mentioned, uh, this is a doozy of a case to start with um, as far as access. Um, you know, we talk about um, uh, actually, it was Dr. Ho that uh, that said it's just putting a needle someplace, which I think is, um, you know, it's, it's a great way to look at it. You know, it really kind of opens things up. But um, I was just curious um, with kind of the involved uh, approaches that you have to do with, uh, with CT, what, what kind of things do you use to help guide what kind of imaging you're going to use for CT versus uh, fluoro in the spine? So in the spine, the, so the, we'll start with the benefits, right? The benefits of fluoroscopy are you can do a harsh, a harsh angle and kind of move it live and see where you're going. Because you can see the anatomy pretty well. The vertebral body, is, there's not that much variation in it. And the nice thing about fluoroscopy too is that when you put the cement in, you can see exactly where it goes exactly at any point in time. Now, when you use CT, you use that for when you have a very tiny lesion or you have tiny pedicles or you're not able to see on fluoroscopy because you can see everything in CT Theoretically, however small it is, floor you can see everything, but not in great detail. And the problem with CT is that you don't really can't really see the live cement spewing any, uh, properly. And then the other thing um, in this case in particular, uh, you know, this patient did have the um, uh, cancer history. Um, did you um, did you ablate this case or just cement it, and why? So just due to the high level and and you know and the the pedicles weren't that small, but it was it was a pretty harsh angle I had to get in there. That took me a pretty long time to actually get into that case, and I was definitely sweating during that case. But we decided just to ablate because you know you can you know studies have shown that ablation is I mean uh, augmentation without ablation is still useful. And that patient actually felt great and was discharged the next day. Awesome. Okay, let's go on to the next case. All right, patient number two. So the 60 year old man admitted to inpatient oncology, six out of 10 back pain without neurologic compromise. The patient has hit, uh, carried a history of stage four renal cell carcinoma. So here are the presenting inpatient MRI images, right? They're not the greatest images, but we can still read them and get a lot of information. I'm gonna highlight the findings here. So you have on the T2 sagittal images, you have abnormal signal within the L4 and L5 vertebral bodies. And on the sagittal post-contrast images, there's diffuse enhancement within those vertebral bodies. You could also notice that there's disruption of the inferior end plate along that L4 vertebral body. And outlined in my you know, poor drawing there is the enhancing soft tissue mass within the L4 vertebral body. Now you can see that it's now encroaching on the spinal canal and it's definitely encroaching on that right neuroforamen. So given these choices, what would you do?
All right, so we got perform percutaneous ablation augmentation, some switching of answers, and refer for radiation therapy. Now, there's no true wrong answer here. The, the thing about this is to trying to, to show the multidisciplinary approach to, to taking care of patients like this. So spine surgery needs to be involved because maybe they think that their hardware or their other levels or some curative things that they could do, because the hardware, after all, is a little bit, is, is more stable than, than putting in some cement. Now, I like that all of you chose between those two middle answers to do ablation and augmentation. I do feel that if we're gonna augment something that we have a known history of cancer in, I do feel like we should might as well ablate it while we're in there because it's not really anything different with the access. It's just more time and a little bit of technology. Now, radiation therapy is a good answer as well. Now, that's a good answer because there's a lot of papers out there that show that if we do ablation and augmentation in concert with radiation therapy, patients do pretty darn well. So I'm showing you the intro procedural images of this case. So each manufacturer has a way of showing mapping zones here. And this shows the posterior wall, which you want to be that, that mapping zone to keep away from the spinal canal, right? On this, on this image on the right here, we show uh, a drill being placed in. And these drills are color coded. So when you drill in, you go all the way to where you want it to go. And you get a color code there. And that, de that determines which size of the ablation probe you're going to get or use. And this middle image here is showing that we really want to kind of have the probes close together in the midline because for fortuitous reasons, the probes when they place together form the shape of a vertebral body. So now we place, place the probes here. The probes are indicated with this radio pick marker and it goes all the way out to here. And now we're drilling for the mapping of the zone below. Now for this case, because we saw all that significant tumor infiltration on that L4 vertebral body, I do like to create a cavity, right? Now imagine that your, your normal vertebral body is now no longer bone anymore. There's no osseous matrix inside there. It's just a ball of tumor. So that's why I like to create a cavity in order to at least put some cement in where that balloon blows up because you really can't predict where the heck the cement is gonna go because you don't know what the tumor has done on a microscopic level. So, I drilled blue balloons up for both of these, and then I placed probes to ablate the bottom level. Filled these retriever bodies up, and you can see that we're getting pretty good end plate to end plate coverage. Definitely want that midline coverage here, and we're getting that both levels. And notice the difference in the fill between the L4 and L5 retriever bodies. You get some of this, what, what my PA likes to call the fuzzy nugget appearance here, that it means there's a little bit of trabecular of the normal, normal bone left here. Here in the L4 retrieval body, it's very lobular, meaning there's a lot of tumor in there. So just a note here, there's a little bit of, of uptake in the vein here, because we're talking about vascular uptake earlier. So this patient had a CT for another reason of abdominal pain, and we were able to kind of see our work here, and just to prove to you that we did get pretty good fill, medial, and end plate to end plate here. And you can see this posterior wall is basically out and replaced with tumor. So you gotta be really careful there when you map the posterior zone. So this is the technology, it's called radio frequency ablation. It involves using RF current traveling from the generator to a probe. So this creates ionic agitation and raises the temperature of the tissue immediately adjacent to the probe. When you get to around 60 degrees Celsius, there's theoretical uh, protein denaturation and also immediate cell death at this temperature. And the main mechanism of action is coagulative necrosis. So the complications for radio frequency ablation include hemorrhage, infection, skin injury, organ injury, and nerve damage. So I highlighted nerve damage here because obviously we're working in the spine for this conference and there's a big old spinal cord there and there's a lot of nerve roots that can cause patients much, much pain and, and agony. So those who know me know that I have a penchant for analogies. So I like to think that me wielding the ablation cause is like me wielding a fire-breathing dragon. So the pearls of, of, of when, we, when we, well, these are the pearls for, for when we use radiofrequency ablation. There's theoretically a protective cortex effect in an animal model that showed that it's up to 30% reduction when you hit a, when you ablate and you hit a solid cortex, the, the power is reduced by 30%. There's also a heat sink effect, meaning imagine placing that probe inside of a highly vascular lesion and you've got constant blood pumping and pulling away all the heat that you've created that causes problems and decreases your effect of the ablation. 
The other notion is using air as a, as a break. Because we describe the mechanism of the probe, imagine the probe sitting in air where the molecules are far apart. You can't really get that ionic ag agitation when the molecules are so far apart. So that's why the air can help you reduce the effect of the ablation. The nice thing about radio frequency ablation is that there's a consistent ablation zone. However, it is a non-visible ablation zone, but there's numerous chicken breasts that are fried out there from the companies that showed you that it's very, very consistent. And there's also that synergistic probe effect, which fortuitously forms in a, a vertebral body shape when you, when you put them together. All right, we'll take questions for this case. Okay, so um, we have a couple questions here. Um, posterior wall involvement, and is that a contraindication? So I think great discussion point here. So that is not a contraindication for me, right? But determining how much posterior wall involvement and how much spinal cord involvement is determines how much the surgeons need to get involved versus how much we need to get involved. Now, the posterior wall doesn't scare me because for the most part, if you, can, you, the anatomy, if you know the anatomy and there's not a lot of lispesis in the patient, you can, you can extrapolate where that posterior wall is. You can also be safe too and push that probe a little bit further anteriorly. And if you burn it, theoretically, the tumor does shrink backwards. So you will get some effect there. And I think... Um... At least, um, you know, with, through some of the questions that uh, that we've seen come across in the past, um, there's a lot of concern about basically your cement pouring out the backside of this vertebral body. Like in your case example, which I think is a great case to show because there is, I would say, not having it in front of me, maybe 70% of that posterior cortex was gone. So how do you know going in there, doing your ablation, you're putting in cement that, that the cement isn't just going to pour out into the canal and cause uh, major cord compression? I don't know. <laughs> but the trick is here is that's why I like using the balloons. So for me, when I do a tumor ablation and it's, and it's majority tumor, I will always create some sort of cavity, whether it's with a, a, a curette or a balloon. I just truly believe in that because you need to get a little bit of cement in there. But you know what? Just go slowly, right? If you go slowly, you can see it on floral. That's why we like floral better. We talked about the advantage of floral. And when you see it go somewhere bad, that's it, right? You have at least treated the tumor in that case. And then that's it. You don't want to further, further deteriorate the patient. Okay. So you're saying that posterior wall involvement is not, is not necessarily or not an immediate contraindication for you on these cases. That's yeah, great. That'd be, that'd be helpful for folks getting these uh, consults in um, that it does need a discussion. Um, all right. So another question in a patient with hemorrhagic met, um, such as this one, uh, which is RCC, uh, absolutely. Can radiofrequency ablation be less effective because of the high vascularity causing a heat seeking effect? Uh, would initial radiation be more helpful? And what is your just kind of general opinion on, on highly vascular tumors? So we do treat highly vascular tumors and we have seen them be effective. We have seen them be non-effective as well. So it goes both ways. Now you can see how well it's going on if you actually know, you know it's a little bit more advanced for this, for this lecture, but if you're able to watch the, the machine and go up to temperature and see how much power is being delivered at any given time, you can tell how it's going. And also, you know, there's other methods which we will go over uh, in, further in this lecture, but yes, it can be, it can be a problem. Yeah, and, um, and I agree with that too. I think that's an excellent point. RCC is just notorious for being highly vascular. Um, for anybody who has used um, alternative systems, we, we saw just a major issue with RCC METs. And um, uh, radiation beforehand, I don't know, I don't personally, and, and Dr. Hell, let me know if, if you, know any um, data uh, about whether or not that decreases vascularity. There's certainly been um, a lot of discussion and, uh, and data out there about doing embolization beforehand. I don't know about radiation. Um, I don't know that I personally have just anecdotally noticed a difference. Have you, Dr. Ho? And radiated, they don't radiate RCC that much either. So that's, that might be why we don't see it. But have you, have you noticed any kind of difference? In RCC nope. or thyroid or? Nope, and it's exactly what you said. You know, there's no, 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 I've never heard of the radiation thing, but sometimes you get a vascular tumor, you know, the, the IRs can, can embolize before to help shrink it down first. Okay. Um, and then just along, uh, we're kind of running out of time here in the question session for this case, but uh, what percentage do you do combined therapy? Um, and combined being, um, I assume, XRT and uh, ablation. So I can't give you a hard number on that. I don't follow that closely. And obviously, once they leave us, you know, it's a discussion with the oncologist and the radiation therapist. I do feel like 
with the with the during our conference, I do feel like they do it pretty often now. So I would say maybe greater than fifty percent of the time, or even like two thirds of the time. Okay, great. All right, next case. All right, this is a good one. So we have patient three is a 42 year old man with an outpatient referral, four out of 10 back pain, limited ability to play tennis without neurologic compromise. And the interesting thing about this was that this was referred to us as a group as we were taking care of a professional, a tennis professional. And for, further, further research found out that the patient actually majored in tennis in college. It was not actually part of the ATP tour. So, these are your playing phones. I'm not going to belabor the fact here. I'm just going to show you that there's really not that much degeneration of this of the, on this patient. Obviously, the patient is an active tennis player, and you know, we're just trying to find other causes. So, this playing phones are basically read as normal. This is the MRI. I'm going to kind of leave it up there because there's a lot going on here before I show you the finding. All right. So here are the findings here. Within that posterior element of, of, of L2, there's signal abnormality that's hyper intense on the T2 images and also showing edema within the lesion and all around the soft tissues on the stir sagittal images as well. And because this is a case conference, you get more beautiful imaging. So you got a CT as well. I just look in that region that, that we saw before. I'll zoom it up for you. So I'm gonna be a little vague here. There's, there's a dense nodule that you see with some surrounding lucency that correlates to, to the lumbar MRI findings. Now think about that as we go to our next question. So what is causing this patient's pain? Survey says everyone is correct. Osteoidosioma. Great job, everybody. So, this is an osteoidosioma. This is one of those pr primary or benign primary bone lesions. This is usually found in the diaphysis of long bones. That's why it's kind of an interesting case. And it's usually presented in the first three decades of life in young patients. And this is your step one question that, you know, NSAIDs usually help them at night because of the pain produced by the prostaglandin related stimulation of nerve endings. Now, obviously you all knew the answer, but there's a characteristic nidus with surrounding sclerosis. And the treatment options here include NSAIDs, ablation, and surgery. So since we already played with fire in this lecture, I decided that we should play with ice. So we decided to use ice to treat this lesion. Now, there are access issues here and I'm basically going to tell you that you got to treat that cryoablation probe like it's made of glass. Now we'll describe, well, I'll explain it to you later. So considering that, you know, you can't stick the probe in the bone by itself, right? Because it's just not meant to do that. So what my colleague did here for, for his case is that we drilled in, or he drilled in with the, the powered bone biopsy device to take a core out of, of bone to, to create a little area for the cryo probe to be placed in. And it may sound complicated, but actually, you know, because we're all we're using imaging, it is really easy to find that 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 hole again. And the other things here, now this is the cryo probe place. The other things here, are, there's a lot of safety stuff going on in this image, which is a great image for this conference. So he also placed a a needle here to in, into the framing. Now he blew gas here to try and create some space to move, try and move that that nerve away that we know that's sitting here. And the other thing that's done here is this saline bag that we like, like to use with heated saline that combats the coldness with the temperature. But really, if you look at this, this is, this is really very safe for everybody based on the mapping here. So this is just a zoomed up image here. And for those of you who can see it pretty well, there are, so the paraspinal musculature is this dense density over here. And you can see that there's a slight different change in the density around this cryo probe. Now I'm going to poorly draw what I think I see is a change in density. And you can see here that this is actual ice ball, right? But notice that the probe goes all the way to here, right? There's our nidus, which is right next to the probe. I know that's freezing just because I know that it is based on 
all the all the probes that we've we've tested and used. Now the point here is that you can't see the ice in the bone very well, so you have to map very carefully. And this patient actually was discharged the same day with zero out of ten pain, and they feel great. So this is cryoablation. So cryoablation involves using rapidly pressurized argon gas, right? So the rapidly pressured argon gas is the reason why I have to treat the probes like glass, right? Because if you break that probe, you're gonna you, the high pressurized gas can embolize quickly and it theoretically can be fatal. So as you use the argon gas, you, you, you decrease the temperature around that probe. Now at negative 40 degrees Celsius, there's intracellular ice formation, osmotic bursting, again, coagulative necrosis, and all this process leads to free radical release. And then it also induces apoptosis from the cellular stress. And then you get the slightly delayed response of stimulated immune targeting of these damaged tumor cells, which is all very nice. So negative 20 to negative 40 degrees is theoretically lethal during a double freeze thaw cycle. The other important thing to know here is that at zero degrees, it's technically not lethal ice. But zero degrees doesn't mean that a nerve is going to cry bloody murder and disappear for six to 12 months or maybe never come back. So you got to be very careful. So complications of cryoblation are hemorrhage infection, skin injury, organ injury, nerve damage. Now we know nerve damage because we're in the spine, but the main thing here is skin injury. Now if you freeze that skin and you kill that skin, it's going to become a problem for everybody because you often need skin grafts to fix that because you're not going to be able to recover that skin. So what do we do? We use a 10 millimeter distance for the ablation margin to keep that skin roughly about, or anything that's, that we care about, eight, above eight degrees Celsius. So this is just a, a picture of an intra or intraprocedural case, a different patient. You can see I use a lot of probes here. And this is just to show you that you really need to be precise in your mapping, and you really need to place those probes exactly where, like in a, in a nice row. Otherwise, you're not gonna get your ablation zone properly. The other thing that's really what I want to show you with that is it gets pretty darn cold in there. And you can see all the ice forming from the areas of the needles that are actually aren't participating in the ablation. And the other thing is that's very impressive because it's incredibly dry in Colorado and it still managed to grab the moisture out of the air and freeze it. This is just a different case. I'm showing you the tumor over here. I'm showing you this ice ball that we formed. It's a little bit off here. The probes are, this isn't sequential imaging. So the probes are placed here and I just wanna show you the ice ball. And in this case, it shows you the gas is able to, or you use the gas properly, you're able to cover at least one to one and a half centimeters in certain spaces. And that's enough to create that, that, that leeway that you need. And then we, it was very important for us to put the skin here as well. So this is just an example of an isotherm chart as you ice sculpt and you can basically make any shape you want with all the different probes. So this is actually the origin of my Game of Thrones analogy here, is that I treated the cryoprobes and ice making as the White Walkers, and really space is the only thing that can, that can save you. So how do we combat this, and how do we effectively use this technology? The heated saline bag we talked about, real estate is super, super important. And we talked about the air dissection, but the other thing that we can use is balloon catheters to physically blow up something that you know is going to create some space. Just another important point, there's a visible zero degrees ice, zero degree ice ball. 10 degrees can be lethal. You want to keep that 10 millimeter leeway. And the other thing is, is a synergistic probe effect. You have, to, you have to use a lot of caution. Also, if you're going to do that, you should do the double freeze thaw cycle. After you do that first freeze, the tissue is incredibly cold. So if you don't dial it down, you're gonna have, you're gonna, that form, the ice is gonna form incredibly fast and large in that second thaw cycle. But the nice thing about it is that you can technically control the ice delivery anywhere from five to 100% at each of the needle, at every single needle, which is very nice. I will take questions for this case. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions and comments here. Um, the first one, which I think is just a fantastic discussion to have is um, uh, any indication of RFA um, over cryo or cryo over RFA, how do you choose which um, modality or which um, technology rather to use? So this kind of goes hand in hand with the questions from the last case, right? So, you know, we have our own renal cell carcinoma metastatic disease conference, right? And we found that we do use cryoblation a lot more for the renal cell metastases because 
for the reasons we discussed before, there's less of that heat sink effect. It, it, just, it just freezes, it, it gets frozen and it just freezes. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is, is where you're accessing, right? The nice thing about the cryoprobe is that you don't actually have to be in the bone or it directly in the lesion to freeze it. So if you're in the bone, in a small bone, you can put that probe next to the bone without actually breaking the bone and the ice will still form through the bone. So that's another thing in when choosing, so basically the lesion composition. The other thing is we do tend to use RF a little bit more, but it's really highly a comfort level because I've been to other lectures where people have shown that they, they do cryo all over the spine too. So that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add to that, um, I think those two cases together uh, was a great example. One was the osteodystoma, and the other looked like an RCC met to me. It was um, kind of essentially necrotic. Um, but um, uh, as you mentioned, cryo, we found kind of overcomes that heat sink. The other benefit is you can stick a million probes in there. So um, that really, I would say probably for, for me, um, that's one of the biggest reasons to pick cryo over RFA is just the size of the lesion or how much freeze you want to get. Um, if you feel that you're going to have a lot of heat sink, trying to overcome that with multiple probes, you're limited in the number of RF probes that you can use. Um, in that case too, uh, or in the other case, the osteoidosteoma, using cryo there in the spine, um, what was, uh, do you know the rationale um, uh, for using cryo over RF in that particular case? I think just because we thought it was a good case to, to do it in. I mean, osteoidosteomas don't come across that that often. And to be honest, I think you could have used either to treat that patient. Perfect. Um, so another question here was the thought process uh, between choosing hydrodissection uh, versus using air to separate the ablation target from other important structures, which um, another excellent, excellent point of discussion here. So I prefer... Uh, air dissection, just because you can see it better, right? You do the hydro dissection, theoretically they go in the same spot. It's a little harder to see, but you can see the, you can definitely tell when it's not cooperating and it's just, just, just going somewhere else. So it's just a little bit clearer to me. Yeah. Um, the, uh, another potential uh, reason to use air is a little bit, it's a better insulator actually um, to like, if you can actually get the bubbles of air in between where you're ablating and what you're trying to not ablate, it's like a styrofoam cup. You just need like a tiny little layer as opposed to um, hydrodissection, which is not an insulator. Ice will blow right through water. It just freezes it. It's more of a displacement technique. So in a case like that, I think, um, you know, what, uh, what you guys did, Dr. Ho, using air there where you don't necessarily have the benefit of room um, to expand um, in a neural frame and to actually uh, push something away and create space rather than insulation uh, is another reason to use it um, as well. But um, I think that point on, on visibility is a great one. You know, you, you go and you put a bunch of uh, fluid, and let, unless you're putting contrast in it, um, into uh, an area, it's just going to kind of mesh in with all the other soft tissues. Um, do you ever uh, use fluid with contrast in any of your cases and why, why or why not? I haven't. That's because I just prefer to, to see the air and, and see where it goes. And, you know, you know like, like, what, like what Dr. Jesse said, you know, theoretically, even though, you know, it'll still freeze through the air if it's close enough, you're actually, it's, but there, there's no insulation at all. Like where you put water next to ice, it's gonna to continue to freeze. So it's not gonna help you. There's no extra effect. So I prefer air personally. Perfect. And then um, last, uh, if you could offer any tidbits, um, some strategies to ablate tumors in hard to reach places, particularly in the spine, um, when you're trying to navigate around uh, lamina, pedicles, uh, and all of the bony structures. So if you're going to talk about really tight spaces like pedicles and stuff like that, we can go back to that thing where I, you know, in that sheet model, I think it's a sheet model that they showed that the intact cortex protects you up to 30% reduction in using RF, right? That's what I kind of relied on too. And I also rely on the reps to use their correct algorithms to shrink down the ablation size. So those are the tools that you can use for that. Perfect. All right. All right, next case here. So it's a 23 year old female college student, outpatient referral, six out of 10 back pain, with trouble sleeping, no neurologic compromise. 
So it's kind of an eye test here. We have axial and sagittal T1 images from the MRI. I'm going to zoom in up here for you. So there's hypo-intense T1 subcutaneous or abnormal subcutaneous tissue within the spinal soft tissues. And that's all you get. So what is the diagnosis? Let's see if I can finally trick you. You've all been doing so well. All right, so we got a little bit of mixture here. So desmoid tumor, sebaceous cyst, and soft tissue sarcoma. Oh, we're changing here. I'm gonna lock you guys up. All right, so the answer actually is a desmoid tumor. So we'll go over this. Oh, well, first I'll show you what we did for this patient. So for this patient, we went through all fire, we, we used ice, so we're gonna use this other technology, which is kind of mystical. So this is called irreversible electroporation. It involves placing probes together and passing electric current between the probes, and we'll, they'll have a slide on for that. The nice thing about this one is why we decided to do that for this one is because it was basically involving the skin, right? We talked about all those things to try and protect the skin, and you know, there's really no protecting the skin when it's basically involved. So this is why we chose to use irreversible electroporation for this case. So let's back up and talk about the desmoid tumor. This is aggressive fibromatosis or desmoid type fibromatosis, which is a proliferation of connective tissue. It's very low incidence, but it's highly locally aggressive and recurrent. And this is treated as cancer. So I'm gonna bring up to you the NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. And a lot of insurance things are based on these guidelines, which is why I'm sharing it with you. And we hit a jackpot in January, 2021. I mean, we were fighting this for a long time. It has become a pain. But now it's on the NCCN guidelines, which is a tremendous gain for us and for the patients. So what is this thing I'm talking about? This is a irreversible electroporation. So this is non-thermal tumor ablation using electric pulses, right? Theoretically, it promotes pro-inflammatory, or this is what I'm told, state of tumor cells, increases the antigen presentation and allows for innate anti-tumor immunity. So when you electrify the, because we obviously we have little, the, the sodium potassium pumps and stuff like that, it creates nanoscale pores within cell membranes by disrupting with electricity. And then also you get the apoptosis effects from muscle homeostasis. Now this is all kind of mystical to me. So I basically consider this technology as magic. So when you use this tool, the extracellular matrix technically remains intact. The vessels in the ducts technically remain intact. And the key point here is that the endoneural architecture is preserved. It doesn't mean they don't get damaged, but it means that theoretically they can rebuild. So the complications for irreversible electroporation are there's severe muscle contractions because basically you're doing controlled electrocution of the, of the structures and that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So even though the patients are under anesthesia, you have to make sure the patient is secure. So magic, right? We don't have much about this, right? The only thing that we like to use for electro, the pearl for electroporation is that the zone is exact, right? And there's less theoretical damage to the next soft tissues outside of the zone. And the thing about it is that there's little data that's out the abdomen. Most of these things are done for in, inoperable, like pancreatic masses and stuff like that. I will take questions for that one. And um, Corey, I'll, um, just for time's sake, I'm taking a look at our time. I, I, I think we have one more case that um, sure. Um, jot your questions on the um, on any of the cases in the in the chat. Um, I'm super happy you threw that electroporation case in there because I think that's a, um, a really interesting uh, discussion as well. So um, we'll go ahead and move to that last case just to make sure that everybody gets their cases in, and then I'll, we'll take questions at the end. All right, we'll kind of get to this last case. 47-year-old man, outpatient referral, eight out of 10 back pain, history of achalasia, status plus resection on chronic steroids. No neurologic compromise. All right, we want to belabor the point here. We have multiple levels of vertebral body height loss. And the important thing I want to describe to you is we don't technically know how old these are, but we know that the patient is, has bony demobilization with the chronic steroid use and stuff like that. So a lot of people get confused and think that this is sclerosis of chronic healing. 
I look at it and I was taught that, you know, this is compression of demineralized bone. That's why it looks like that. If you don't believe me, we have the accompanying MRI showing the edema, right? So you have the abnormal T1 signal and height loss on the T1, and you have the stir signal showing that these are recent fractures. All right, last question. What is our complications of tube augmentation? Last chance for Jesse to show us your vocal cords. All right, all the above, great. Only tricked one of you. We talked about cement embolization, you know, thermal nerve injury because it's an exothermic reaction. And then there is this theoretical risk of cement toxicity, however, however small it is. So good job. So when I look at a case like this, I see that there's not a lot of degeneration, right? So, and that means I don't see a lot of, a lot of disc height loss and it looks like there's relatively functional disc. So the thing that I want to do in cases like this is to restore what was broken and that's regaining height. Now I'm showing you this image here because in order to use all those fancy devices, you need to have space. And this pedicle is about eight to 10 millimeters. And you can basically land a helicopter or a plane or park a Mack truck in there. So you can use all your tools here. This shows that we're using this implantable device, right? My colleagues at this case, right? You can see there's two devices here. There's skis on either end of the device. And as you crank a device open, it physically opens up that end plate. And for the mechanics out there, you can see that this resembles a car jack, right? So why I like this is that it opens up the end plates, it keeps the end plates open, and it doesn't, and it can't shrink back down because we're going to fill it with cement afterwards. So we did it for those two levels of most most loss. The other two levels, they didn't have any height loss, so we just filled it with cement. And you see nice trabecular fill within them. So we filled cement, or the, he filled cement in this case. You can see it's very very good fill, and the vertebral body stayed up. Now this is the pre and post images, and this is just remarkable, right? We're able to basically, or almost near anatomic reduction back into the normal height of the, of the vertebral body. And therefore you can get those discs to, to work again and patient can stand up. So not a proper conference without some sort of study being talked about. And then I, I mentioned this is a study out of, out of Europe and this was for this implantable device. The main reason why I like this device out of this study is that there's reduction in adjacent level fracture and non-adjacent level fracture between 50 and 66% reduction compared to the device versus the balloon kyphoplasty. And to me, keeping a patient out from having to come back in and to do it all at once is very important. So that's why I was sold on this, on this technology. So now this concludes this conference of Ice of Fire. As long as you don't know, as long, people who didn't know this is Game of Thrones reference, and I've, treated, and I've taught you how to treat tumor and various things with Ice Fire and magic. So I thank you. Well, we thank you for your attention. You know, these are our references. So I didn't make everything up myself. And we thank you for your attention. Thank the Society of Skeletal Radiology. And I think we don't have any time for any more questions. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ho, uh, for that lecture, the case space review was awesome. I think we covered a lot of different um, ablation techniques, a lot of different types of cases. Um, and hopefully, um, this uh, just kind of shows a lot of the folks that are on um, what kind of things can be done in MSK radiology. Um, and it's a, a, it's a whole big wide world out there and there's a lot to be um, uh, learned and, and experienced. Um, so thanks again, everybody for joining. Um, the next lecture in the SSR uh, resident education series is gonna be January 12th. Uh, at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, MSK tumor imaging. And your speaker is gonna be Dr. Blake Jones from the Medical College of Wisconsin. And we hope to see you there. And thanks again, Corey, for that lecture. No Bye. problem.